In this video, we're going to discuss differential rate laws, which relate the rate of reaction expressed as a derivative, say dp dt, where p is a product, to the concentrations of reactants in solution at the time when that rate is relevant. So say the reactants are a and b, there's a function of those molarities that we can set equal to the derivative, and this is the essence of the differential rate law. It's called a differential rate law because we use differentials and a derivative in the rate law. So we're not looking at concentration in time directly. We'll look at that when we cover integrated rate laws. Here we're looking at how the rate of change of a concentration is related to concentrations of reactants. And the nice thing about this is it shows us how as concentrations A and B change as the reaction occurs, the rate varies. As it turns out, we can often gain great insight about the specific path followed by a reaction, namely the reaction mechanism from its rate law. This is information that thermodynamics can't provide since thermodynamics deals with state functions. It's, it's path functions like the rate of reaction that give us insight into the path of the reaction, specifically the reaction mechanism. The rate of a reaction is related to the concentrations of reactants in solution as a reaction is occurring. Importantly, we don't think of the rate as depending on the products. This is because from the chemical kinetics perspective, we treat the reverse reaction completely separately. It's a completely separate process with its own set of unique reactants. And typically, the greater the concentration of reactants, the faster the rate. And if you think of the typical graph of concentration of a reactant over time, this should make sense. The reaction occurs rapidly in the early stages, that is, the slope of this line in the early stages is very large, and as the reactant is depleted, this line peters out and becomes much flatter. This is a graph of the concentration of a reactant, let's say, as a function of time. Early on, the reaction is fast, and the concentration of A is high. Later in the reaction, it becomes slower, and the concentration of A is relatively low. We'll develop a conceptual model that brings in the microscopic and molecular level to explain why this is the case in a future video. So in general then, we can express the rate as some function of the reactant concentration. So here we're using our general reaction, A of A plus B of B goes to C of C plus D of D. Here's the standard reaction rate expressed in terms of C. We could also write this as dx dt if we wanted to. And that's some function of the reactant concentrations A and B. And notice the product concentrations do not appear. We don't consider these when studying this reaction in the forward direction. Interestingly, in many cases, the function of the reactant concentrations looks like something out of the law of mass action. The rate is equal to some constant times the concentration of A raised to some power times the concentration of B raised to a different power. This equation is what we call a differential rate law because it relates the rate itself in terms of differentials, in terms of derivatives, to the concentrations of reactants. And even though the right-hand side looks like something out of the law of mass action, looks like something out of an equilibrium expression, we need to be careful to distinguish this from an equilibrium expression because it's not the same. So just to reiterate, differential rate laws relate the instantaneous standard rate to reactant concentrations. And each of the powers that the reactant concentrations are raised to are called kinetic orders. The total order of the reaction is generally written as the sum of the two, m plus n. And we say that a reaction is, say, first order for one, second order for two, third order for three, etc. k, the constant of proportionality that relates this expression that looks like something out of the law of mass action back to the standard rate is called the rate constant. It typically has units of molarity per second divided by a certain, number, a certain number of molarity units, right? Such that the units that pop out when we multiply by a to the m, b to the n are molarity per second or moles per liter per second. Do note, and this is a very important point about these kinetic orders m and n, that these are not the same and not necessarily equal to the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. That's why we use, for example, A and B here in the reaction and M and N here. These are distinct numbers which are not generally equal. A related point is that we cannot deduce M and N, these kinetic orders, from the stoichiometric coefficients. We need more information. In particular, we need intimate details about how a reaction works and the nature of the reaction mechanism to figure this out. The balanced chemical equation only tells us 
how many molecules of reactants are forming a certain number of molecules of products, the rate law does not have to reflect that stoichiometry, and in cases when the reaction mechanism is relatively complex, we'll see that the two do not match. A and B do not match M and N in general. Depending on what these orders come out to be, we get different behavior in the concentration of reactants over time. So let's begin by considering a case where there's only one reactant, so only A, and look at different possible values for M. M is typically an integer or a half integer, and we're going to look at three possible values for M, 0, 1, and 2 in this video, and then we're going to integrate the rate law and look at the integrated rate laws for M equals 0, 1, and 2 in the next video. So let's start with the first order case when m is equal to 1, such that the exponent here is equal to 1. So this is the corresponding differential rate law. Notice I've got the standard rate on the left-hand side, and I've got that equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the first power. And so this is a first-order reaction. We also say that it's first order in A, since the order of A is equal to 1. In words, conceptually, the reaction rate is directly proportional to the molarity of A, and it decreases as A decreases. This is what we're used to. The line flattens out. The concentration versus time curve flattens out as A is depleted and the reaction moves forward. Consider what a first order reaction looks like on a graph. And I'm actually going to mix things up a little bit for the first graph and look at not the concentration of A or the concentration of C with time, but the rate of change of C with time as a function of the reactant concentration A. Now, the stoichiometric coefficient is a constant. So as A increases, the rate increases, and it does so in a linear way. This is the hallmark of first order behavior. The slope of this line is equal to K, the rate constant. We can see that in the differential rate law by noticing that K is the factor that multiplies the concentration of A, which we're putting on the x-axis here, such that it's equal to dc dt. And just to make things perfectly clear, let's plot 1 over c dc dt, the standard rate on the y-axis. In this case, the slope of this line just is equal to the rate constant. If we think about the usual plot of, say, the concentration of c versus time, c builds in in the usual way. It appears rapidly in the early stages and more slowly in the later stages of the reaction as we get closer to the equilibrium state over here. In the second order case, now the concentration of A is squared on the right-hand side. So now we have the standard rate is equal to some constant times the molarity of A squared. Now the reaction rate increases with the square. Now the reaction rate increases with the square of the molarity of A rather than simply with A itself. And so if we think about this graphically and we think again about the standard rate as a function of the concentration of A, now, instead of that rate increasing linearly, it actually increases like a parabola, increases quadratically. And k is related to how quick this rise is, how steep the curve is. So a larger value of k is going to be associated with a steeper rise in the rate as a increases. The important point for second order behavior is that both of these are parabolas. If we think again about how the concentration of, let's say, c is going to vary with time, we'll once again start with a very rapid increase and will flatten out over time. And the flattening out process is more extreme since the rate of change of concentration of C depends on the molarity of A squared rather than just the molarity of A. However, eventually we will reach a point where the molarity of A is so small that the concentration of C is barely changing with time. Finally, I want to consider zero order behavior which is fascinating. The order of a reactant may be equal to zero. In that case, the molarity of that reactant to the zero power is always equal to one, so we leave it out of the differential rate law. That's why this wasn't written here. Zero order behavior when m equals zero means that the concentration of A is completely irrelevant to the rate. And this happens more often than you'd expect. Now the reaction rate is constant and independent of the concentration of A. That means the concentration of C increases linearly with time, and the concentration of reactants decreases linearly with time. What do these look like graphically? Well, let's once again plot the standard rate, dx dt, as a function of the concentration A. Now think about this. Nowhere in this equation relating the standard rate to concentrations, quote unquote, does the concentration of A appear. That means that dx dt is a constant. 
and independent of A. So the rate is the same regardless of the concentration of A. Kind of an interesting notion, but it implies that A's concentration is not important to the rate of the reaction. We think about, for example, how the concentration of C changes with time. Instead of getting a curve, we actually get a linear increase in the concentration of product with time until we perforce reach an end point where the concentration can't increase anymore because of stoichiometry and the fact that the reaction is limited by how much reactants we have.